Welcome to my channel. Hi guys, how you doing? Oh, I'm having the most horrible, um, incredibly, um, I don't know how to describe it. I've been literally running around in circles. Uh, maybe I'll do an entire vlog on this. Um, but uh, you would not believe the things that have been happening to me in my own home. You wouldn't believe. And um, the most important, the most serious thing is um, that I just discovered my driver's license vanished, stolen from my wallet. And I, I never leave it anywhere else. I, it's there with all of my other important things. And it's always with me. And so it, it really brings me to another conclusion that um, whoever did this most likely did not, um, did not take it from you know my car or my purse um obviously my purse yes but um this person uh actually came in to my condo when i was there because i remember hearing something and i thought it was nicha and um i remember i had just purchased some things at the store and I, I remember going to my bag and the things were missing. And so uh, a few days later, I tried to do a load of laundry, um, which I did. And um, I noticed, and guys, I'm going to show you pictures afterwards. I, I, I can guarantee you, this is a brand new laundry machine. I, I purchased it during... Um, or just before the pandemic, uh, because the other one, the superintendent broke it when he decided to turn off the electricity in the middle of my cycle. And so that was it. It was gone, the old one. And so um, this one, I'll show you in photographs, has a crack right on the lid. And I, my eyes always go there when I empty and load the machine. I can guarantee you, it, it just magically appeared. Um, it, somebody took a hammer to it. And actually, this will be the second dent that it took. I, I remember the first dent, um, as soon as it was installed, somebody came in while I was not home. And just hammered it. So there's a chunk missing. And guys, it's not me. It's not me. Um, I, I, I'm very gentle with my appliances. And it's not me. And so um, also the knobs on my cooktop have been hammered to death. One of them I cracked accidentally. But the other one was completely removed by someone else. I don't know what the person did with it, but it's gone. My kitchen cabinets are hanging because somebody came in and unscrewed the screws and took the screws with them. So uh, I can only um, conclude that <laughs> the... Um, the administration and management are totally incapable of um, handling uh, security issues in the building. And furthermore, the person who is doing this to me most likely is the person who leaves the garbage sitting on top of the chute, crawling with bugs. Okay, enough of this griping. I, I promise you I, this is going to be a serious vlog. And we are going to um, launch a discussion into the case of um, Tina Fontaine, a First Nations 
teen girl who was found transpired. And so, um, guys, her, her story is so tragic. It's so sad. And, you know, I, I went over the uh, situation with resident schools and First Nation um, people and tribes. In when I did my review on the Frank Young case, uh, the story of a child who went missing and was ultimately found um, transpired in, in f months later in places that everybody had searched. And so, um, yeah, it's very sad. And so, um, let's get into this discussion. And I want to uh, first focus on Tina's mother, Valentina, who had such a tragic childhood um, as a First Nations child. And I, I, I really actually don't know where to begin with this. So um, let's just briefly um, introduce Tina. Now, Tina Fontaine was a New Year's Day baby, and she was born on January the 1st, 1999. And um, she was found, uh, her remains were found on August the 10th, 2014. She was a First Nations teenage girl, reported missing, and discovered, uh, transpired um, in August. And her case, guys, is among um, the high number, very high number of missing and um, transpired uh, in Indigenous women of Canada. And her homicide did renew calls by um, various activists for um, Canadian government to conduct a national inquiry into this entire issue. And so what I want to know is, are we still waiting? In December of 2015, a suspect was indeed charged with second-degree um, homicide in her case. But we will go over those details um, in just a while, not in this vlog, but in another vlog. And however, as for that suspect, no forensic evidence or any eyewitnesses were ever directly linked to him. Um, or linked him to her death. And so um, the cause of her death, therefore, was never actually fully established. So, guys, this case prompted the um, Canadian government um, to commit to creating a, a, an independent national inquiry into the issue of... Um, murders and violence against indigenous women which started in 2017 really i i just wish that this inquiry would be extended to women of all um classes and and races and whatever you know um I really do think that it's a serious problem and not enough issue is given at all to violence against women in general. The experience today is certainly proving that. Now, a bit about uh, Tina's grandpa. Uh, his, her uh, paternal grandfather was a residential school survivor. And um, now you know that I spoke about these schools at some length in Frank Young's um, case, when I went over that several months ago, I believe it was last spring, last summer. And um, indeed it was a horrific um, truth for me to acknowledge because I hadn't until that point been as fully aware as I am now of what these poor tribe children and adults had to endure um, when their families were torn apart. And so um, uh, his own, her grandfather's, Tina's own grandfather's 
experience um, led, as a child, led him to years of severe alcoholism and violence. And uh, as we get into the story about um, Valentina, Tina's mother, who we will call Doc, um, we will see what I'm talking about. And so um, at the age of 12, her father, Eugene, um, this is Tina's father and not Tina's grandfather, um, left his home in Sag King First Nation, which is 121 kilometers uh, northeast of Winnipeg. And he moved to Winnipeg where he fended for himself wh while he lived on the streets. In Winnipeg, he developed an addiction to alcohol. So he was a severe alcoholic. And so Tina Fontaine's mother, Valentina Duck, was raised in a blood vein, First Nation, um, a tribe. And so it was 250 kilometers north of Winnipeg. At six, Duck was removed from uh, her mother and returned several times uh, by the Manitoba Child and Family Services. And so Duck experienced a number of significant traumas as a young child. So we're not talking about Tina yet. We're talking about Little Duck. And so, um, it, it, you know, it, it, it's so sad that she had to go through that. And I don't have the details. But as you know, residential children were habitually forced to um, go into these orphan schools and, and just, you know, um, be torn apart from their families. They're only loved, um, loving environments in many cases that they had ever known. And so, um, the, you know, she went through, Tina's mother went through a very, um, severe hardship as a child, as a result, which, uh, the Manitoba Advocate for Children and Youth said in a 2019 report, um, they were not appropriately or even properly addressed. At 10 years old, Duck was removed from her family home permanently. After that, guys, at 10 years old, um, she was essentially fending for herself. And um, I, I don't at all sense that she was any safer without her parents or her mother. Um, you know what I'm saying? I, I believe that she was deliberately put into a situation that was much worse than the one that family services got her out of. So, at 10 years old, guys, 10 years old, she was repeatedly moved and began to be exploited by those um, uh, adults around her. And she used alcohol and drugs. I, I don't want to talk about that uh, because I, I don't want my vlog to be an introduction into um, reckless lives. You know, for I, I don't want anybody out there to get any ideas. I'm not promoting a reckless life for a teen. Uh, I'm just saying that this is what her life was like from then on until she went missing. Going back to Duck, um, her childhood, um, Duck was 12 years old when she met Eugene, Tina's father. And at the time, guys, Eugene was a 23-year-old man. So now we can see how properly the Manitoba Child and Welfare Services are supervised their wards. They didn't, however. Um, child and Family Services um, records do show that they were aware of this inappropriate relationship 
um, and that the relationship um, that was inappropriate um, with uh, the father um, was because not only he was very mature and too mature for a 12-year-old child, but he had a violent past. Um, so, uh, you know, Tina's dad had a very violent past, and that included severe addictions to much more than alcohol. So, uh, Child and Family Services files note that Doc, you know, this is the mother, Doc frequently ran away from home, um, from her foster homes, um, just so that she could stay with uh, Eugene, Tina's father. And so in 1994, um, Doc described feeling very, very low. And um, let's talk about that a little bit. Experienced what many residential school orphans did experience um, in those days. And so she, Doc felt depressed. She felt misplaced, displaced, suicidal, isolated, alone, unloved, uncared for. Should I go on? And um, I think these are all the reasons why she kept going back to be with Eugene, who was on the streets. This is so sad. In the spring of 1996, at 14, Duck gave birth to her first child, not Tina, who was immediately and permanently taken from her by Child and Family Services. And so I'm going to stop here because this is a very heavy um, load of information for me to relay and absorb. And I don't want to give you too much all at once. But um, so as you can see, Tina's life, this is before she was born. Tina's life was, uh, it, 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 it never had a chance to thrive. She was never nurtured. Um, she was on the same, uh, she was in the same level um, as her mother, Doc. Neither of these women ever got out of that repetitive and um, destructive pattern of uh, abuse that they were also, not only were they inflicting abuse on themselves when they turned to addictions, um, they were abused by the system and by people beyond the system, out of the system as well. So uh, what I'm saying is they never had a chance. They never had a chance, guys. And so uh, that's all I have for you today. Um, it, it, it's a sad case, and we'll get on with it next time. I, I think for next time I will be describing the... Um, the First Nations Reserve from where um, Tina Fontaine and her family lived, were from. And so um, I'm, I'm going to leave you with that. And then we'll get on with the case as well. And um, it, it's sad, guys. It's really sad. I, I, it's hard for me to introduce this properly because I'm grief struck. And so, um, anyway, thank you very much for listening and watching. And if you want to stay updated with this case and other cases, um, I, I still haven't finished the case of um, Rachel Charles, please um, subscribe. Like that, you will be notified as soon as I upload. Take care, and bye for now.